Thank you, Sarah. Um, so much to say about all of that, too. Um, we'll save that for after. Uh, and thanks to all of you guys for coming out. Uh, I had no idea that there were so many people that cared about testing the media. <laughs> I promise you that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm going to satisfy that bitch, I swear. Um, so I'm also just excited to share some of the fruits of the labor for the last six years that I've been working on. Um, and it's, it's nice to do that amongst so many supportive faces. So the talk for today, uh, uh, for the last six years of hard work, uh, is on Hawaiian montane peatland ecology and history through the lens of testes amoebae and cladostera. Uh, and there you can see we're hopefully going to answer some of those questions, this pensive human walking towards that box. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to start us off uh, with some context. So earlier this month, the IPCC uh, um, sent out a, a special report on uh, climate change uh, and land use, and specifically how land use can be used to mitigate the effects of climate change. And it's interesting that this comes out during a period where there's been lots of headlines about afforesting and reforesting, um, kind of a, a salacious uh, headlines about these. And um, what I find interesting about this report is that while those are strategies that are part of the solution for mitigating climate change, some of the most important immediate and long-term uh, strategies we can use are conservation of important carbon stocks. And they have a major shout out in this report for peatlands, which you can see an example here. And peatlands are um, ecosystems where net primary productivity is greater than the loss of organic matter due to <coughs> decomposition. And typically this, this occurs because there is a maintenance of high and stable water tables. Uh, so there's anoxic conditions and slow decomposition. And these ecosystems exist around the world, uh, both in the temperate latitudes, boreal latitudes, but also the tropical latitudes, uh, both in high altitudes and low altitudes. Uh, and I'm particularly interested in a special group of montane peatlands in Hawaii. You see some examples here. And uh, these ecosystems um, are important for carbon. They're smaller than their lower latitude uh, partners. Uh, but they're numerous, and uh, they can be really important because uh, they're clustered in these kind of tight compact areas on mountains around uh, the tropics. They're also very important for uh, biodiversity because they support and uh, harbor often specialized and endemic species, and uh, they are, are also integral in the hydrological cycle. They store and they regulate water. And in this research, I have uh, developed methods for monitoring the changes of these peatlands over time and space. And I focus on using bioindicators, which are just species that tell you an ecological effect by their presence or absence. And I focus on testing the maybe, so we're going to start counting, that's the first time I said that word. <laughs> testing the maybe and the cladastra. And this talk I've broken into three parts. So part one will address uh, diversity patterns of testing the maybe in Hawaii. Part two, uh, I've built a hydrological transfer function that is based on testing the maybe plus the inclusion of cladastrian data. And for the third part, I reconstruct a 4,000 year history of peatland change uh, in ecology and hydrology using those tools. So let's uh, jump back a little bit. These peatlands in Hawaii, uh, they suffer from a lot of the same threats that, mon that montane peatlands in the tropics uh, experience broadly. Um, in particular, uh, grazing by cattle can be really damaging to these ecosystems. Cattle uh, have been um, uh, Use, uh, especially in the Andes, um, and are really destructive to high latitude peatlands there. Uh, they trample and they also bring animal waste, which neutrifies the ecosystem. But then also um, in Hawaii, feral undulates, especially pigs, are especially damaging. They tromp around, they wallow in these peatlands, they, like, they particularly like to sleep in them. Uh, and um, they provide pathways for invasive plants, which is really problematic. And some of these photos come from Michael Payton. He's done some awesome work in Hawaii this past summer using camera traps. And uh, so it's a really successful season. I can't wait to see what comes from those data. In addition to those biotic problems, there's also abiotic uh, threats. So uh, these peatlands in, in uh, tropical latitudes that are at high elevation, they sit in a very, very narrow band of climate, suitable climate. And in Hawaii, um, climate trends have directed into a kind of a concerning pattern. For instance, in the last several decades, precipitation as a whole has declined across the state. Precipitation um, extremes are increasing, so that means that precipitation is more flashy when it does rain. 
the number of days in between rainstorms has increased, which is really uh, concerning because as soon as the rain stops and the clouds part, things warm up and dry up pretty quickly. Uh, following that same thread, relative humidity has declined in general across the state, as well as stream flows. And so the, this, this interaction between biotic pressures and abiotic pressures is very complex. And so I, uh, I propose that one way to track those changes is to develop dense monitoring tools that track environmental change in peatlands through space and time. And I uh, use this tool, Test Data Media, to do quite that. And so Test Data Media, there's a video that's going to play in the background here. Test Data Media are single-celled, free-living uh, protists that are all defined by having a shell. And uh, that shell is an opening, sometimes one, sometimes two, where pseudopods emerge, and they use those pseudopods to move themselves around and grab their food, which you can see is, this is a, a maybe pulling himself on a microscope slide. And uh, the media classically have been defined as being lobos or phylos, which uh, is a characteristic of their pseudopods, which either the lobos maybe have these kind of thicker pseudopods, and the phylos maybe have these more fine and narrow pseudopods. And these organisms are the top, they're abundant in peatlands, and they're also the top predators. They feed on soil bacteria, fungi, as well as um, algae, but larger testated amoebae can feed on bigger prey, such as other amoebae. Um, and I just, before I move on, I want to just give a shout out to an awesome resource uh, that I've used for many years, is MicroWorld. This is just a, a scientist that has been recording amoebae species and taking awesome pictures and classifying taxon taxonomy. And it's just been so useful for a graduate student, and I, he's been very gracious to allow me to use his images in this talk. So thank you, Ferry, and, and that resource. Because uh, these shells are morphologically diverse, which you can see example on the left, uh, and for the fact that they are well preserved in peatlands, it's been uh, um, commonly used as a proxy for environmental change. And those, those pseudopods, they need to have some thickness of water to be able to move around. And so for decades, and I think even centuries, uh, it's been proposed that moisture is probably a strong control on the distribution of these species. And um, in the last few decades in particular, this has become a very standard practice for studying people change over time. Here's just an example of a recent paper that, you know, that uh, combined um, paleo environmental uh, investigations using these species just in North America. And so this, these are very broadly used and a very powerful tool for studying ecology. That second group of organisms are the Cladostera, and very different group of organisms, um, also known as the water fleas. These are micro crustaceans. They've been in the news a lot, especially in Madison, because we have them in Lake Mendota um, as of recently. Uh, and um, uh, they are uh, feeders of phytoplankton primarily, but they also graze on bacteria and other micro eukaryotes. And they exist in all the in many lacustrine systems and marine systems, but they also live in the saturated waters of peatlands as well as in the ponds and bogs. And they've been commonly used as uh, paleo indicators. And I adapt some of those tools for the research here. Before we move on, I, this is just an aside, but there's a rich history of Clodastra in research, uh, and actually that relates to where we are right now. So if you guys, uh, you can probably identify the folks on here in this book. This is um, Ed Burge, uh, professor of zoology and past president uh, of UW, and the namesake for this building. And so Ed Burge wrote his dissertation on Cladosterin in Lake Mendota. And you can go find his dissertation uh, in the archives, and it's handwritten because this was in 1877, and uh, so that's 10 years after the first commercial typewriter. So I don't know if his office had a typewriter then, um, but it, it's pretty hard to read. Uh, but so, and he is one of the, the uh, progenitors of Cladosterin research in North America. And his colleague and longtime friend, uh, Professor Chance Judy, had a PhD student by the name of David Fry, who uh, also studied uh, Cladosterin underneath their tutelage. And David Fry was impressed with the preservation of the components of the Cladosterin exoskeleton made of chitin. And he is really the founder of using these tools as paleontological indicators. And so I just think, it, and I use these methods in my own research. And I just think it's very cool that a lot of the beginnings of these um, ideas and methods began on, on this campus. That just seems to happen so often in our, our research. It's very cool. So uh, first, we're going to address this issue of uh, diversity patterns of amoebae in Hawaii. These have not been classified in Hawaii. The first, time, the first and only time these were recorded was in 1908, 
part of an expedition. Someone grabbed some moss and sent them to Germany. Um, they did like nine species, but I want to talk more. Uh, and I focus on um, this area up in northern Hawaii Island called Kohala. It's the oldest of Hawaii's five volcanoes. Uh, it's very low altitude. It's, it's not as, as tall as Mauna Kea and Mauna Loa, so down here. And the summit of Kohala is capped in a dense, uh, wet rainforest. That rainforest also has a mosaic of peatlands that are um, dotting kind of more um, uh, depressions and flat areas on the summit and windward area. So I sampled several peatlands there. I also sampled some peatlands on the windward flank of Mauna Loa. These peatlands are, are very different. Um, they occupy very, they sit over top much younger substrate, um, about 1,000 to 3,000 years old. And the uh, vegetation of Kohala is really interesting. Much of this coverage in the green, which is the wet forest coverage, has a monotypic understory of sphagnum palustri, one species of sphagnum. It's indigenous to the mountain. Uh, and so um, many of the peatlands are also covered in this moss. But several of them have no history of sphagnum, and so it's a very interesting place to study microbial diversity. So to generalize some uh, field methods that I use, uh, sample the, the um, heterogeneity, the peatlands, the hydrological heterogeneity, and the vegetation heterogeneity. And each location uh, where we sampled, we sampled for MEV, and we also carved a hole in the surface of the peat to reach the water table. We measured the water table. We also measured uh, pH within the water table and conductivity of the water table. At each location, we uh, recorded vegetation cover in a 30 centimeter by 30 centimeter plot. Um, in, sorry, back in the lab, uh, we measured bulk density of the soil and loss of ignition, which is a measure of um, organic matter. And then, obviously, a lots of uh, microscopy is involved in this. For this first section, I wanted to classify the heterogeneity of the peatlands, and so I used a multiple factor analysis and a um, hierarchical cluster analysis to help group those different peatland types. And I measured a variety of different um, di uh, diversity metrics, both taxonomic and using the functional trait approach. Uh, and to, to do those comparisons, I used just simple traditional pairwise comparisons, as well as um, generalized additive models. And um, you can see the different measures we use, but I'm only going to focus on four functional trait measures uh, in the same time. So that first functional trait that we looked at is kind of going back to the original description of tested amoebae, which um, is interested in how many lobos versus phyllos amoebae there are in the community. And so the lobos amoebae, which you can see here on the left, they tend to be bigger amoebae. They have bigger shells. Um, they have a wide variety of prey that they can eat. Um, and the phyllos amoebae tend to be smaller. They tend to favor um, smaller prey, such as bacteria and fungi. Um, these are also some of the first amoebae to colonize bare soil and bare substrate, which are then followed by more of the, the larger lobos amoebae. So a ratio of these two that's often used as an index is thought to be an index or a measurement for um, soil development and ecosystem maturity. The following three functional traits that I use are biovolume of the, te the test itself, the compression of the, the test of the species, and the, the diameter of the aperture. Um, and I use these through the lens of community-weighted means, which just uh, takes that functional trait value and multiplies it by the relative proportion of that species within a community. So I'll walk through what these are. Biovolume is a geometric equation of the size, the volume of each uh, species' shell. And it's believed that a uh, thicker water film in the soil should be able to harbor larger tests. So there might be a, a, a hydrological uh, constraint there. With test compression, this is just a measurement of how each species is shell, how compressed it is versus where you've got a, a sphere versus very, very compressed. Um, and again, um, if you are a shell that's more compressed, you're going to be better adapted to desiccation. And then aperture diameter kind of tracks patterns of biovolume. Uh, but in addition, if you have a wider diameter aperture, that means you can ingest bigger prey. So there might be a trophic constraint on aperture diameter as well. So let's move into those results. Um, these are the results of the multiple factor analysis, which just seeks to find correlations between um, data sets of different types. And so we have an environmental data set that includes water table depth, um, pH, LOI, and, and bulk density. 
and then vegetation cover. And I extracted the site scores from the first two dimensions of the MFA. And I plugged those site scores into a cluster analysis, cut that dendrogram into five groups, and those five groups resulted in um, these broad categories of peatland habitat that makes sense when you're out there in terms of your observations. The first on the left is a, a dry acidic sphagnum hummock, followed by a sphagnum hollow, which is you typically have a, a sphagnum hummock hollow topography in some of these peatlands where you have a hollow is kind of con uh, cave and pretty wet at the bottom. And then we have a mixed uh, heterogeneous composition of sedges and sphagnum in a tussock. Uh, the fourth group is uh, juncus, which are rushes. And then this fifth group is a non-sphagnum bryophyte uh, with Brancospora association, with Brancospora being the native sedges in these peatlands. And here's a data-heavy slide. Uh, what I'm showing you here are relative abundances of test data media from all of those surface samples that were collected. So this is 107 surface samples from um, several different peatlands. And what you're looking at here are columns, which are different species with their relative abundances. And that uh, y-axis are those locations. Then they're grouped by those ha general habitat types using these little icons that I created. And um, I'm showing you this because I've uh, sorted relative abundance by those habitats. And you can see that there are some pretty clear differences between more common, more abundant species by these different habitat types. Now I'm just going to go through a couple of, a few of the stories that were interesting to me from um, this analysis by looking at um, comparisons between habitat and then also how uh, these different functional traits <laughs> Uh, vary on these environmental gradients that I measure across all sites. And I do that by using uh, GAMS. And GAMS are really similar to generalized linear models, except GAMS allow for nonlinear relationships between your explanatory and your response variable. I wanted to view those uh, nonlinear relationships. And we included in this model water table depth, pH, bulk density, and uh, mean annual rainfall, which is an estimate. So this first story is uh, this Lobos to Phylos Amidi index. And what you can see on the top left here is that for four of the five habitats, they're predominantly dominated by Lobos Amidi. The fifth habitat, the Bryophyte Rhinocera Association, is dominated by Phylos Amidi. And when we uh, modeled that change of Lobos to Phylos index across the different environmental gradients, we didn't find any strong relationship with water table or pH or bulk density, we did find a correlation with uh, mean annual rainfall where wetter sites or sites that have more rainfall have more local salinity. But lacking that, that clear environmental gradient uh, suggests to me that there's a biological interaction between the test data community living there and the vegetation composition of the habitat. The principal uh, <coughs> component of the that Ryan Cosper Biophyte Association is Racobetrium lindlanuginosa, which is the dominant bog spe uh, moss species in, in Hawaii. Um, and this particular species has, is known to have many cyanobacterial associations, and that cyanobacteria is a potential food source for Phyllosamidae. But in addition, especially when you compare Racobetrium to the other Biophyte in Koala, which is sphagnum, it has a very low water holding capacity, and it desiccates very rapidly. So uh, you might expect that the amoebae community living in these bryophytes would be uh, smaller and more compressed, but that constraint, as we see, is dampened in high rainfall sites. So in sites where there's more rainfall, that constraint to be more compressed and in favor of more phyllos amoebae is reduced. The following three functional traits, uh, well, and then actually, we do see that that site, Bryophyte right Mycospora, has more compressed tests, so we do see that it follows in the previous thread. Uh, and then for biovolume and aperture diameter, we see that the juncus habitat, the wet juncus habitat, has the largest uh, test sizes and the broadest aperture diameters. Test compression was correlated with water table depth, where drier sites that have a deeper water table had tested in that were more compressed. Uh, but we did see a water table depth relationship with biovolume or aperture diameter, which surprised us because uh, that, I mean, that's just the pattern you see in stagnant peatlands more broadly. Instead, pH was correlated with the size of the test and the diameter of the test. 
And so what we see here instead is probably more of a trophic response where uh, uh, food availability is a stronger control on test size and, and, and diameter of aperture of koala than uh, just moisture. And from that analysis, we found that uh, pH, water table, and rainfall emerge as important controls on test data VB, especially functional traits. And so in the second part, I built a hydrological transfer function that related test data VB data plus classroom data, this new group, uh, to, to be able to model uh, moisture changes. And I do that using a transfer function, which is essentially where you just take Species data, you plug it into a model, and you output an environmental variable that uh, is based on a relationship that you've established by doing modern ecological studies. And uh, for these next two chapters, I like using this framework, this diagram is produced by Juggins and Burks. Uh, it walks through the procedures that I use. I know there's a lot of uh, information here. We're just going to focus on the top part right now, where we sampled surface uh, peat, right, this is a link, but we can pretend it's peat. Uh, we sampled the surface of it, uh, we, we analyzed the modern biology, so the modern testing of EV and cladosterins there, and we also measured environmental variables, pH, water table, at each of those locations. We build a calibration data set, the species data, environmental data, and we plug it into a transfer function, which gives us an environmental variable um, estimate from those species data. And to do that, I used ordination methods, both um, constrained and unconstrained. Um, and I'm just going to show you uh, some results from a non-metric multidimensional scaling uh, of 89 communities. And I'm just showing you the species scores from those um, communities. And what you can see here is, uh, so the blue names here, these are the cladosterin taxa that we observed. They're clustered on the right end of the first axis of the ordination. And uh, when we overlay our environmental variables, depth to water table uh, is most correlated with that first axis of variation. The second axis of variation is most correlated with changes in pH. So that means that species down here are more associated with high pH values, and species at the top of the figure are associated with low pH. This uh, gave us uh, precedent to develop um, estimates for the moisture optima of these species because they seem to be very much controlled by water table. And what I'm showing here are weighted average estimates of the individual uh, water table optima of several different species. Uh, and those species are aligned on this figure by uh, wet loving to dry loving. And what I just want to show you from this figure is that the cladosterate species uh, taxa, as a, in addition to several wet loving testing um, have are, are good indicators of standing water or very saturated conditions. And we have other several taxa that are associated with um, drier conditions, with deep water tables. So from here, we can plug in species assemblage data and estimate water table um, values from the species data. And so I'm showing you that this figure here with measurements uh, versus predicted values uh, of water table. And um, we have a, a, a root mean squared error prediction uh, from this model of 9.75 centimeters and R squared of 0.62. Uh, and I tested for spatial autocorrelation in this data set by removing the entire peatland and all the samples from there, from the, from the calibration data set, and then attempting to model um, water table from species data, but we don't include um, those samples in that, um, in, in that model when we're calibrating it. And so you can see the, the calibration um, for each of those peatlands there. And uh, this um, model we've uh, taken and uh, adapted to apply to several uh, long cores. I'm only going to show you the results from uh, one long core here. Uh, and now we're on that second part of the diagram, so the bottom part, where we collected a fossil core. We analyzed the biostratigraphy uh, of the test data median cladosterins at each of those intervals, uh, produce a stratigraphic diagram, and we combine the data from that stratigraphy with our transfer function to produce environmental reconstruction. We focus on this peatland here, KHL1, uh, and uh, KHL1 is kind of the southern ed ed edge of uh, this wet forest complex. 
Uh, as a rainfall, it's a little bit on the drier end, although everything's covered in fog and dry is a weird uh, description there. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but it, it is uh, certainly, it's on the edge of the forest and um, drier than us and other people can be studied. And this is what this site looks like. Uh, the location of the core is right there. We're now measuring water table depths, the daily water table depths, um, for the last over a year now, and we're going to use that data to help calibrate our model. And as you can see from here, we have no history of stagnant. So this site was chosen specifically uh, for this analysis because it lacks, as far as we know, any history of stagnant. You can see on the top part of this image, stagnant is encroaching on the margin, and it can, it's even trying. You can see a couple of capitulum tried or part of this to make it out onto the peat wood surface. And it's useful that we lack this, um, stag this vegetation history because in uh, Kohala, Sphagnum has a, um, a, I don't know, controversial take. Uh, it is treated as indigenous. Uh, there's evidence that it has been Kohala for over 20,000 years. But our evidence in Sarah's work as well, we have, um, we, we only see an expansion of Sphagnum palustri in the most recent 150 to 200 years. And that uh, expansion, uh, that vegetation change, has profound impacts on the microbial communities that are living there. And so by focusing on this non stagnum peatland, uh, we've at least reduced some of that complexity. This is my most text heavy slide, sorry. <laughs> but I just want to get all the methods out there. Uh, so we retrieved, or rather, um, the Bielman lab retrieved this core in uh, 2015, a two and a half meter core. Um, these are collaborators at the University of Hawaii Manoa, and they're running several other um, um, analyses on this, on this core too, in addition to the immediate clonostra. Uh, we measured, we, we established the age of the core by uh, measuring seven radiocarbon uh, measurements, uh, calibrated to calendar years uh, before present, with 1950 being that standard for uh, present. And we built a um, chronology using Bayesian analysis of uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo simulations of the uh, uh, age uh, probability distributions. I did a quasi quantitative analysis of peat stratigraphy by analyzing the remi identifiable remains of plant macrofossils in my samples. And so I, um, I, uh, developed a, uh, I developed a chronology of the important peat forming plants. Um, throughout the, the length of this core. And of course, analyzed Testidamini, Cladostera. I also, why not, I analyzed or counted Chironomid mandibles and Copepod eggs and Tardigrade eggs because they're all there. Um, and, uh, and I have a wonderful resource that helps me identify these. Um, and uh, I used a uh, weighted averaging with a partial least squares regression model to uh, estimate the, uh, water, the, the to reconstruct water table depths from species data, including testing the medium class. So here is a figure showing literally all of those results, almost. Um, and what I'm showing is this is another stratigraphic diagram, but as opposed to the previous diagram I showed you, the y-axis is now depth. Okay, so we have a core, something like this, and at each interval or slice, we identify and analyze the amoebae and clodosterins at each interval. So you're looking at those changes in species data um, over depth. Testy and amoebae are shown in the brown, with our clodosterin taxa shown in blue. On the far left side, we also see that um, stratigraphy that was analyzed, and so these were grouped into general categories um, anything that looked like a grass was a granuloid. Um, anything that had sorine, leafless sorine, was a, in the pteridophyte category, with, and it was often had wood associated. Um, then I, I identified all the mosses to species, but those were pumped into a moss category. Oreobolus is the principal sedge on peatlands outside of uh, Hawaii Island. And then um, the bottom uh, layer of this was predominantly silty clay. And the uh, assemblages of testing and media in clonosterin uh, were grouped by using a stratigraphically constrained cluster analysis, which seeks to group like samples with each other, but constraining that uh, based on samples that are close in space on that core. 
and uh, used a broken stick model to guide the zonation, and we found four significant zones. This bottom zone here, we'll call zone one, uh, is dominated by um, several different planosterid species, but the base we have some dry indicator testing immune taxa and intermediate testing immune taxa. This zone two, we lose most of our cladosterins. The cladosterin data drops to basically zero. And we have a high abundance of dry indicator taxa, such as Trinopixis, um, as well as Asolanomosporum. And then in zone three, we have a uh, rebound of cladosterins. Um, and we lose those dry indicator testing immediately. And zone four is the zone that reaches to the surface. We still have cladosterins, um, though not as many and we have a much more diverse uh, assemblage of different tested immunity taxa. The far right here is showing the reconstructed bar table values from that data. And so the base of the, of the um, core has uh, moderately dry water tables that were estimated. Those water tables reach a high during this period of peak cladosterin uh, data, uh, cladosterin um, um, relative abundance. We have our, high, our, our highest water table values here, so our wettest conditions were reconstructed during this period. In zone uh, two, uh, we have some of our driest uh, reconstructed values, and then those rebound again in uh, zone three. Those values are relatively stable towards the surface of the core, although there might be a slight drying trend near the surface. Here are the results from the um, analysis of um, age control. And so what you can see here is we have a basal date in the um, silt clay layer that's about 9,000 years old, and then the basal date of the peak itself is about 4,000 years old um, over that two and a half meter uh, span. So this core actually represents some of the most rapid sedimentation rates that we've recorded in Hawaii. Um, and we do see a slowdown of sedimentation rate in that period of 100 to 150 centimeters, which corresponds to that dry period uh, based on the, the transfer function reconstruction. What I'm showing here uh, is um, that same reconstruction, now with a 10% low, low, low S, uh, and we're plotting now by age. So we've replaced depth with age based on that age control. And um, I also plot those other three weird things that I counted. So pyramids, uh, copepod eggs, and turbate eggs, and I use those primarily to help guide that stratigraphy. And the distribution of these different um, organisms helps to define or gives, gives support to the stratigraphy based on the amoebian cladostra. Whereas in the bottom section of this core, zone one, we have you know, some pyramids, some copepods, some tardigrades, and then at the beginning of zone two, we lose all of our pyramids, all of our copepods. Those are aquatic organisms, so they're indicators of wet uh, conditions. We do get our highest target grades. They pop out during this zone. And I'll, I'll take anyone's best guess about what's the best environment for, for target grades. Uh, they can live anywhere, but I'll do it right now. Um, but in my data set, they do reach peak abundance in uh, wet mosses. And so we do see a transition in our stratigraphy from graminoids and other sedges to moss. So that might explain the increase in target grades. And then at uh, zone, the transition to zone um, three, we have a pulse of pyramids again, uh, copepods, and then in zone four, there are a bunch of copepods. So that zonation um, has support from these different um, microorganisms. Uh, and then next, I wanted to uh, set this record in the context of what we know about climate history and vegetation history in Hawaii. And what I've plotted here are the uh, known high-resolution Holocene paleo records that have been developed. And I'll just say that there's a, a rich literature and rich history of studying vegetation change in Hawaii, um, and Sarah has, uh, has pioneered a lot of that too. And um, you can see from this figure that this record in, on the Big Island uh, is the first and, and will be the only that we have so far high resolution policy record of environmental change. And so we're really filling a, um, an important uh, void of our data here. And if we look at some kind of uh, broad um, uh, hydrological and aridity measures from these data, uh, we find that 
So focusing first on our own record, we had peat water tables at 3,000 years ago. Uh, and then we had peatland drying between this period of 2.7 and 1.6 thousand years ago. At a record on East Molokai, we also see high and stable uh, water tables, wet conditions, probably uh, associated with a, a change in frequency of winter storms and storm frequency, so uh, wetter storms. And then this uh, period of drying between 2.7 and 1.6 thousand years ago is mirrored uh, by a, a peatland record in um, East Maui, a lake record also on East Maui, uh, and a lowland uh, uh, biomarker record on Oahu. So what is going on during this period of time? If you uh, think about the important climate patterns that affect uh, local climate in Hawaii, uh, El Nino and the, the El Nino Southern Oscillation has uh, the most important uh, influence on global uh, Hawaiian climate over um, different time scales. And if we plot out a proxy for El Nino frequency, which is a percent sand record from a lake in the Galapagos, with uh, more percent sand in this record indicating higher El Nino frequency or, fre or, or El Nino um, intensity, we see that that period in my record with uh, the reconstruct dry conditions corresponds uh, closely to this period of uh, peak El Nino intensity in the Pacific. And this, uh, this, this pattern um, is uh, in, in some ways a little bit uh, concerning for me. So we see uh, a major shift in the peatland ecology and hydrology associated with the known period of high El Nino activity. If we think about future climate in Hawaii, we have a trend of drying uh, that is expected to continue into the future. And with global climate trends, we expect there to be a prolonged or maybe a permanent El Nino state uh, in the not too distant future. And we can see that during periods of peak El Nino intensity in the past, we have completely reshuffled the ecology of some peatlands that are very important for uh, water storage and uh, water regulation in these, um, in these uh, wet uh, uplands. And so, uh, to conclude with some uh, concluding remarks, um, this is the first detailed survey of testing ABB in Hawaii, and we found that functional traits were distributed along water table depth measurements, pH, as well as uh, uh, rainfall. And rainfall appeared to be pretty important in our data, so that was a surprising result, and so it would be really interesting to um, try to map testing ABB community changes across different rainfall regimes on the islands. We also developed a, a new transfer function relating species data to uh, environmental uh, data. And we incorporated cladocerins in that, which is a novel approach. And we found evidence of drought conditions uh, during a period of El Nino um, activity. And this is the first time we see that pattern on a big island. We found that on other islands too. So what we see is a synoptic response on the island chain to El Nino. And uh, I, from all these, I just I, I think the message to me is that you can use some really small things to answer some pretty big questions. And so I, I'm excited to take your questions, but I, this has just been uh, is, I wouldn't have been able to do this without the help from so many uh, partners and collaborators. And uh, Sarah, I, this is really just possible because of your support. Um, and constant support from the beginning. You know how difficult this work is, and you've always been encouraging, um, and your constant uh, reminder to just think deeper and deeper and deeper has really worn off on me, and um, I, I sit here and I stare at my interviews and I just keep thinking, what will Sarah say? Uh, <laughs> so, um, and just your, your, your constant um, support and, and mentorship has just been huge for me. I want to just thank my thesis committee too, uh, Tom, uh, Brett, Jack, um, and Bob. Um, thank you all for being um, challenged, for challenging me on my assumptions, and also just being mentors for several years. Tom, I took my first uh, graduate class with you, and I'm still my favorite class uh, in graduate school. Um, and then just being being available when I needed um, some some help. Uh, and Bob uh, was the first person to show me the peatland. He introduced me to ecology. And he ruined me. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I just I'm so grateful for his mentorship for all these years. Who put faith in a 19-year-old um, college student who didn't know what he wanted to do, and you threw me in Alaska. And uh, I just that was such a huge moment for me. And um, now I'm an ecologist. So thank you. Um, 
And I want to thank also the rest of the Hotchkiss lab, um, particularly Patricia. Uh, Patricia is a research uh, scientist in, in our lab, and Patricia is my collaborator um, on many of these papers. She's the first person to help me identify thedosterins um, and pretty much everything else that you've seen um, that wasn't an amoeba. Uh, and so Patricia is just an incredible encyclopedia of paleolithological uh, remains, and she has saved me so much time going to a library to figure out what the heck this is. And she's just been also an inspiration for me as a scientist. And then Sue's not here, so I can embarrass her. Sue Hyun Kim is my um, uh, lab mate and is really responsible for getting me out of so much trouble with uh, <laughs> logistics and uh, permits and funding problem. I mean, and just and also emotional support. Uh, she none of this would have happened if it wasn't pursued. I, I totally believe that. Um, and the rest of the Hotchkiss lab, thank you guys for your just constant support and feedback. Um, I want to also thank uh, the Beelman Lab. They were very welcoming to this new uh, approach and have been really helpful um, just to get uh, access to new material. And I just thank those guys. Um, the rest of the scientist community on, in, in Hilo, uh, Peter Batusa too, for giving us a lot of light work here. And um, I had several undergraduate students that put trust in me to do their senior theses, and they've contributed a lot of data that we've seen. And then, of course, uh, none of this, this is all soft funded, so none of this would have been possible if not for um, a Paleontological Society grant and the department, um, which provided um, grants when I really needed them and fellowships when I also really needed them. And just a big, huge mahalo to the ranchers and landowners that allowed us to tramp around on their cattle ranches <laughs> day after day. They spent an entire semester showing up at their door first thing in the morning. Walk through your cows and get back to our cave sites in the mountains, and they were always down with that, and um, that's pretty rare, I, I think. And so, thank you to those guys, and also the um, stewards of those lands, the Kohal Forest Reserve System and the Natural Area Reserve System, which are taking really good care of these places uh, and trying their best to um, also maintain the peatlands. And um, I can't say enough about my, my entire family is here, um, and my friends, uh, family. Thank you for coming and supporting me. Um, you guys have always had my back, and you thought I was a scientist from day one, even when I did it. Um, and so thank you for always being there. And so many friends, you guys have kept me alive, I mean, especially my cohort. You guys have um, kept me fed, <laughs> smiling, and happy, and uh, hydrated. <laughs> and I just, uh, I've needed you guys so many times, and I'm also just so proud of you, too, for also pitching up. So with that, I'm happy to take uh, your questions.